most everybody in this uh, room knows who I am. This is a little echoey. Can we have it down just a touch? That sounds great. Okay, so I'm Claire Chang. John Ward and I um, are helping to co-sponsor this event, the Solar Store of Greenfield, and Trap Rock also cat coins, I believe it's in the room. Yes. And we want to um, open up this book signing of Lionel de La Vanya's book, To the Village Square. And look at the picture there. Oh, okay, that's the mystery woman. If anybody knows who that woman oh. is. <laughs> Well, it is. It, having been printed in the recorder article, everybody's now asking, who is the woman on the horse? And we all assumed, me included, that it was Anna. But she says, no, it's not her. I look just like you. <laughs> Should I announce the contest? Oh, is there a contest? There's a contest. Oh, well, we can get to that later. Okay. We can get to that later. All right. So. We're all gathered here because Lionel has brought his wonderful book of all these pictures of the anti-nuclear movement through the ages. And we are so excited to see these in print because we've all seen little bits and snips all about it, but not all collected into one book. And it's really quite remarkable how from the 70s till now, the number of people, the range in ages, diversity of everyone across the world who have been involved in shutting down all these awful nuclear reactors. It's quite nice to see it all documented in this book. Um, so I should probably do some rudimentary announcements like the restrooms are through that door before you get to the bar and um, there's also restrooms downstairs. And then the Arts Block is sponsoring this event um, for free for all of us to gather. And they are providing a cash bar for us. And, um, and of course, Lionel will be book sign signing books um, after our little discussion um, and sound interludes. Um, and let me see, is there anything else I need to talk about? So I think most of us here know why we need to shut down nuclear reactors. I don't want to go through all of that. But I think what, but I think what we all um, can talk about is where we need to move from now. And especially given the constraints of climate change, political atmosphere, um, economic realities, there are a number of different opportunities that all of us can take in various different avenues for action. And those are some of the things that either the songs or the discussions will hopefully touch upon. And um, I'm actually, I just realized, unclear who is supposed to be coming up after me <laughs> and who I should be introducing. Oh. Well, Lionel gave me this card, which is how to pronounce his name. Because being a person whose English is their second language, um, I had no idea how to pronounce French, even though French was my third language in high school, but I didn't do very well. So, um, Lionel de la Vanne. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, it's 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 wonderful. Use the mic. The mic for you to be, please. Uh, yeah. So it, it's, uh, it's it's coming home for me here. I live in Western Mass, uh, west of Western Mass, right now, which is Starkbridge. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not the same. It's especially uh, heartwarming for me to, to be here and to see the people that I've photographed, that I've, uh, that I've spent such 40 years with right now, uh, until now. Um, and uh, so I wanted to talk to you uh, briefly, uh, because I 
which is over a thousand words, and the book must have about one million words that way. Um, it's, it, it's, so where I come from, for the people who don't know me, is uh, I'm from France, I'm from Paris, and I'm a child of May 1968. And I happen to uh, try to open my horizon, uh, find solutions to the problems of the Western world, which uh, were opened up for me in '68, and and uh, and came to America to visit. And of course, I ended up uh, in West Massachusetts, of all places, which I found quite interesting. Uh, for for that wish to be working on solutions and not just talking about them, like we were in Paris. So uh, that is the background, and, 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 and what, so from six from Paris to Washington. First, I landed in Washington uh, for the uh, Vietnam uh, veterans big demonstration uh, on the Mall in May 1971, and also I, I, I compare this event to the events of May 1968, and I, I, I saw something that was new to me. The, uh, the, the way that people uh, were getting together relatively peacefully in those huge, mar in those huge marches, participated in, and, and, uh, and that's what created, in the end, one of the two pillars of that book, is the uh, is the beauty of, of, of grassroots democracy. Uh, so, so, so the book is is about that experience, verified throughout, verifying it in Montague certainly and growing with a movement that I've learned to photograph uh, and on and on. Uh, again, uh, I, I don't want to go rambling here because uh, I promise it to be short. Ça va? Ça va? So, the environment is, uh, it, it, as, I mean, I, People have asked me, well, how did you get interested in a, in, in a nuclear power struggle? Well, I, I was not first interested in that, I was interested in safe energy and solutions. And, and that's what the, 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 the folks that I photographed had first in mind, I, first as an agenda. And, and so it, the, my progression there is organic in ways. I tried to peddle the story of resistance to the media, which laughed at me at first. And, uh, the vindication comes, uh, came, of course, unfortunately, uh, with Three Mile Island, with Three Mile Island at first, uh, and then with a uh, channel, and, and then uh, Fukushima, and Fukushima is with us right now. So, um, so that's what the book is about, it's about people who've made a difference, who, who seem to have, to have achieved something, and who certainly have, but whose memory right now could be very easily, could be forgotten, uh, because uh, if, if the story of, I mean, I feel like this book is filling in a void to pass on to the younger generation, to, to show them that it is possible, organizing from one, two, three people, and see the plains of Lake Pleasant, the, uh, the plains of mountain, so-called, so are the, a few people under the rain and, and not looking like much, and, but then growing to a movement that that spread nationally, that spread internationally, uh, and so the, the book is trying to make that historic record, and as well as uh, it, it's passing the baton to the new generation. If I, if I, what, what am I trying to achieve with this book, really? beyond the historic record is I, I want to show that it's, that it's possible, that it is, uh, it, it, it's up to the young generation to, to, to pick it up. Uh, we, we, we've got to look at the nuclear power industry for what it is. It's, uh, it's, I find it very deceptive. My book is showing that. So these are the few facts that I brought to the mail here. Uh, you <coughs> You will see in Chernobyl the devastating, the killing fields of nuclear power. Uh, you will see them in Fukushima. Uh, and that's when I'm asked if nuclear power is, 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 is isn't nuclear power green? Well, <laughs> that's just a ploy for uh, uh, that 
the industry has developed uh, through its well-paid public relations firms. And I'm making the counterpoint there that nuclear power is not safe. It's not green. That is, uh, uh, that is a lie. So hopefully, I, I, I do all that. I fulfill that promise to the younger generation. And, uh, I, I would love some, uh, I don't want to speak much more here, and I will fill in where I leave it. Um, and uh, let me see if I had a, an interesting point to make to you besides. <laughs> I, 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 I could, I could uh, you know, there's something that, that I forget here, is the reality of Fukushima right now. Uh, it's, it, let me read to you, uh, and that will conclude. Uh, I, uh, very specifically, I arrived in Japan in, uh, in uh, uh, was it April 2013. I was not sure what to expect. Uh, it's, it's far away and the issues were, were quite big. So after all my years of struggling to portray the voices of scientists and concerned citizens on the danger of nuclear power, I encountered validation in the most common form. Mothers and mothers, mothers and fathers, just like me, their children, my children. But their children had something mine did not. They would grow up with a stigma, not knowing how long they would live, not knowing what impact the nuclear disaster would have on their lives and livelihood. All of a sudden, everything had changed. When I interviewed people in the affected area, what struck me most were the similarities between their lives and mine. One day, your radio beeps and you must exit your home, run to your car, crisscross highways, looking for escape for safety, uh, radio doesn't work, by the way. You have lost your job, your health, maybe even your children. And you can never return to your home. For the victims of Fukushima, even in their relocation or exile, their children wear dosimeters, which measure radiation exposure, to school every day. You make sure they, you know, it, it works. You, you conveniently attach to the book bag so they don't forget. My experiences made me see that I too was vulnerable that one day my own home could be so desecrated that I might not be able to retrieve a photo of my parents because it was so, so contaminated. And that's throughout the book, you will see those, uh, those testaments. Sometimes we leave friends behind, but leaving your home behind is another story. The brochures could be Chernobyl or Fukushima. That's where I live right now. That's Western Mass. That thread can never leave you. My encounters in Japan left me with an extreme sense of compassion and personal vulnerability. Uh, you know, you look outside and suddenly that town is empty because you can't go back there. It, it's finished, you've got to exit. That is the reality of Fukushima. We've got it today and it's here to stay. And, uh, you know, and, and if we think it's, it's far away, no, we all have, as Michio Kaku says, a piece of Fukushima in us, and, and, and Chernobyl, by the way, and Rocky Flaps, and, and you name it, and the testings in the 50s. So hopefully, I hope I have made a little difference in homage in very humble ways. I want to, to, uh, to thank the people here who, are, who have eminently been part of that scene. By definition, this is what has become a, a, a life purpose for me, is to credit uh, you people to have made that difference. And hopefully, youth will carry on, because we need that point. So that's all I want to say. And I want to say thank you. For that uh, George in big time here. Uh, I, I, and that was emulation to me. And if I had not dedicated the book to Francis uh, Crow and my friend Steve Turner just passed away, it would have been to Anna, of course. Who, this book is, a, is, a, is, a, is the work of a team, really. And Anna, through editorial consultations, uh, beyond her introduction to the book, uh, as, uh, is, is, is the genesis of that book. And so, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Leonel. This is actually the first time I've seen them big on the wall. And it's, I really feel that this is Leonel's gift to the world, you know, because to follow this theme over 40 years and not get diverted or depressed um, 
and, and to bring this out in this form, I'm just so delighted that he's done it and to be part of it. And it's taken years of effort to, for it to appear. And I think like so many things that have happened with nuclear power, it's, it just comes at the right moment because there is still the nuclear danger in so many communities around the world from Fukushima. And now, 40 years after we reacted to the plan of reactors near our home, 40 years later, we're seeing nuclear power, natural gas, fracked gas, fracked oil, LNG, fossil fuels, mountaintop mining, the pump storage, all of these, it's like the last gasp of the old paradigm of centralized, controlled energy of which we are uh, both consumers and victims. So we really have a lot on our plate. We have to finish the job. And, uh, so that's one reason why I decided to come home. <laughs> and I've been living in Germany since 1985 and other parts of the world as well, where they wish they had any electricity. Um, and uh, so I've had a lot of time to think about this issue and, and what we did. And uh, what, and living in Germany, I've seen that industrial, industrialized, developed societies can function with 50% of the energy use per capita of Americans. Um, and uh, there, in Germany, there are no climate deniers, I mean, no climate change deniers. Uh, everyone is dealing with it somehow, at home, in their community, politically. Um, I, now that I'm back, now that I'm home, I never thought I'd be here in, uh, was it Clark Sportswear? <laughs> um, but it's a wonderful space, and I really hope it will stay as a community space. And I want to thank the Arts Block and, and uh, you know, that we can be here. So we're 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 honoring this book and we're welcoming this book. But there was another part of another artistic contribution to the movement, and that was from our singers and songwriters. And so I'd like to invite Pat and Tex Mountain up. They came up with the first song um, when we were just kind of under the rain and this old broken umbrella, you know, and the Monty playing saying, no, we won't let this happen. And so they're going to sing uh, the iconic number one song first, and we thought if any of you want to sing along, at least in the chorus, there are um, the words in the Well, you have the words, but the song was written a long time ago, and I and I just feel like there's a certain heaviness, so I'm throwing in a little curveball, and you can just keep singing the words, and I'll throw my curveball in on top of it. Thank you. 
really a theme song for the Seabrook occupation. It's Charlie couldn't be here tonight because he just lost his partner many, many years, and it's very sad. We're going to sing his song for him. Can we read the chord? Would you like to come up here and sing one of those? For Dorsey. Okay. Along with uh, Charlie King and Court Cheryl Fox, George and James Carr, and we uh, formed the Bright Morning Star, which came directly out of the zebra. Yeah. Actually, updates and probably uh, reflective thinking on 
the four nuclear power plants that have been closed by Citizens Awareness Network, uh, the activist group. Uh, and before We'll, we'll give us that overview. And when she finishes, we'd like to open it up to comments um, that anyone else would like to make, whether it's on nuclear power or what's ahead for us. And then Anna will finish with talking about where do we go from here. So before I ask Deb to come up, I just, uh, I, I'm inspired to tell you a story that goes back, back to this era of the mid-70s. Uh, I, I came to the Valley in the mid-70s with my partner who was uh, received a position at UMass, the five colleges first, in women's studies and medical ethics. Meanwhile, I was running uh, a feminist restaurant and cultural political center called Bread and Roses in Cambridge. So I would just come here a few days a week uh, during that period. And, but when I came, I read the reporter and I, I, I was constantly learning of the activism in preventing the toppling of the weather tower on the Monte Plains, the activism, particularly Franklin County, but in the valley against nukes. And also, I think there was a new magazine, was it called New Roots or something like that? Yeah, I, I loved it, read it avidly, and it was promoting what was called then alternative technologies. They would be called renewables today. So, um, after, uh, I was inspired to enter uh, UMass School of Engineering in environmental engineering for a graduate degree after reading Barry Commoner, of course Rachel Carson before him. So I studied environmental engineering and when you do that, it's like hazardous waste, solid waste, air pollution, clean water, how do you keep water clean, uh, clean polluted water, and also wastewater treatment. But when it came time to do my thesis, I had read no nukes and pure cheese and, and where do we go from here was in the air then. So in the new roots and, and, and elsewhere here. And so I was inspired to convince my thesis advisor that instead of doing something on clean water or wastewater treatment, air pollution, I wanted to do I wanted to do a design of a passive solar I didn't know what, but I gradually figured it out, retrofit to an existing like 1870s house, was the house we were living in. So he agreed. And then I had to you know, transfer, not transfer, but study more in mechanical engineering. And as I got that design down, there were a couple of mechanical engineers and a carpenter and Perkins and Wendell who were really keen, really keen to, to build this uh, with me as part of my master's thesis, so we did that. It was a two-story solar greenhouse attached now, well, to the house we live in, which is in Montague Center. And when I finished that 1980-81 and went to work for EPA, I thought, I'd really like to do a passive solar house. So I took the design, the model we had used, sort of worked with it, and then we bought a piece of land on East Taylor Hill Road in Montague Center, and with a builder, we were in recession, the country was, there were no buildings going up. This builder was eager to learn how to build passive solar houses. So uh, he worked with us, we built the house, and he went on to build dozens of houses after that, checking back with me regarding, now that you've lived in it, is there anything else you would change, et cetera, so that there would be improvements in it. But I, I just want to say that this was, you know, just an example of an individual doing this. I met Nancy Hazard, who's here at the time, and we've reconnected since I've come back to the Valley. She was doing great building work. And um, I just want to say that, you know, it was an individual's act, but I was inspired by the air, I would say, the air quality in the Valley at that point, in which the, the buzz in the air was sort of no nukes and uh, alternative energy. So uh, with that, I, I, I want to open it up for the discussion and also the sequel, which will be where do we go from here. But Deb Katz first, our venerable Deb Katz. <laughs> An extraordinary one. And uh, one, one woman, um, with, with people working with her, of course. I'm going to go for it. So, 
I can hardly see anyone because these lights are blind and it always drives me nuts. But look, we have pulled it off and done it. And that is what we have to start with. This was a 15 year struggle to take Vermont Yankee down. This is amazing and this is all of our win. It is all the people's win that made this possible. This was not a fight with the NRC. In, you know, with Yankee Row, Connecticut Yankee, and Millstone, we fought with the NRC about the systemic mismanagement of those nukes, and we won, and we brought them down. But in fact, what became clear after that was that it was impossible to get any satisfaction whatsoever from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that they had become, at best, an old boys club and that their job was to keep aging, decrepit, second-rate nuclear reactors going as long as possible. And they took that job seriously. And what we all had to do is reevaluate how we were going to focus our energy in a way where we could have an effect, not just where we could write a letter to our senators who weren't going to do anything, but where we could really do something and make a change. And what we came up with was the idea of states' rights. And the notion that states can control what happens within their borders. And involved with that was the idea that states could reject nuclear reactors operating within their borders. And operating during the time when they were going for relicensing. Because although the Nuclear Regulatory Commission supposedly deals with safety, and that's a joke, but they ostensibly deal with safety. A state has the right to, in fact, reject a nuclear power plant operating within its borders on the basis of economics, the environment, a slew of things, as long as they don't use the word safety. It's like pornography. You just can't say safety no matter what, but you can say a lot of other things. And, what we, <laughs> and we did say a lot of other things. But what we launched was an on-the-ground, grassroots campaign with other groups going door to door, knocking on one door after another in Vermont, throughout that state, to move not the people like us, some of whom have been screwed by nuclear power, so we don't want it, and some who are just against it, because those people are on our side. And we weren't going to have any effect on the you know, fanatics who believe in it. But what we had to do was move the middle. The people who were undecided, the people who weren't sure they wanted to get involved, the people who actually had a lot of despair that it was possible for them to do anything that had any meaning to change anything. I used to go around and say, look, I suffer from radiation without representation. You can vote. You can decide what's going to happen to Vermont Yankee. And I'm telling you how you can do it. I'm telling you the actions you can take. And it was the work of all of these groups and all of these people, and a lot of them in Vermont, going over that damn border, you know, and letting people in Vermont know that they needed to represent not just themselves, but people in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, basically people in the tri-state community, and that democracy could work. And in fact, democracy did work. And it worked. And there was a vote in 2010 with now Governor Shumlin, but at that point he was the head of the Senate, and he took that vote. And Republicans and Democrats alike voted to reject Vermont Yankees' continued operation. Republicans and Democrats alike, because it must be acknowledged that we have a lot to thank Energy for. We should not forget what a second-rate outfit that is and how stupid and insensible their approach to dealing with all of us and even the state of Vermont was. And they helped because they did such a bad job, they made it easier. But even with that, it was they actually acknowledged that there were more 
there were more calls to the Vermont Senate for that bill on Vermont Yankee than it happened even year, the year before on um, the issues of gay marriage. More calls. The calls were just coming in because people had had enough and people decided that they could change the course of history and that they had to risk getting involved, win or lose, win or lose. And we knew that we could win and that the job of winning was enduring as well, you know. I guess if you endure long enough, maybe they'll either call you venerable or an asshole. And since I took the boy Yankee, I'm not an asshole. Of course, that could get changed. <laughs> so if you stick it out long enough, if you believe enough, you know, I want, I just, it drives me completely nuts. We made up, if you look, Green by 2015, we came up with that slogan, Claire was reminding me, in 2006. Part of it was poetic, but part of it was really prophetic in terms of the commitment we were making to close that nuke. And in fact, that is what will happen at the beginning of 2015. This nuke will close. <laughs> what do we do now? I mean, can we all go home? I remember no. after we closed Yankee Row, it was like, OK, now I can go back to my garden. It's completely full of weeds. I haven't seen my kids in weeks. They don't even know me anymore. How, how can, you know, let's just call a halt all this crap and relax a little. People from Connecticut came to us and said, look, you closed Yankee Row. We need your help. We need you to go down there and help us close this nook, which we did. And in some way, we became a regional group in the process of this. So is it time to put all of us out to pasture? Is it time? <laughs> no. No, for a couple of reasons, and one is decommissioning, of course, because Entergy's idea of cleanup is basically how dirty can cleanup get. And that's what they're looking for, and we can talk about that. But what I want to talk about is a bigger issue, and then later people can talk about how to address it. But I want to talk to you about a hot, sexy new topic, and guess what it is? The grid war. Oh, how about that? Do any of you remember deregulation in this state? Yeah. Oh yeah, who could forget that charming notion when we allowed nukes to be sold to her for 25 cents on a dollar, and Entergy came in and bought up all these nukes, these second-rate aging reactors, and what's happening now? They thought they were going to make a gold mine. It was just going to be a breeze for them. Well, Entergy is going down the tubes. We actually have a petition into the NRC about the vulnerability of Entergy with Vermont Yankee and cleanup and the Fitzpatrick reactor in New York and the Pilgrim reactor in Massachusetts. <laughs> and they accepted this petition and the higher ups at Entergy tried to stop the NRC from looking at this. And we got Bernie Sanders, and we got Senator Markey to, in fact, threaten to hold congressional hearings. And so the NRC is now investigating this with Entergy. But in fact, what it means is that Entergy is really a sinking ship, as are other nuclear corporations that expanded because of deregulation. And what does that mean? Why should we care if they're a sinking ship? In one sense, shouldn't we just let them sink? <laughs> shouldn't we just do that? I would do that. But what they want to do is reinvent themselves. And how are they reinventing themselves? They want subsidies. <gasps> Can you believe it? They want re-regulation. They want to be on the top of the list on the grid, on the independent system operator. I know you can hardly understand what that means, but they're uh, basically an organization that decides who's on the grid and who you get electricity from. And what Entergy is saying is, 
Well, we're clean energy. We deserve a special place. We deserve a special place. We have fuel on site. We're not like that awful gas, you know. They want to bring those pipelines up. They can't get the gas here. We're, we're really groovy. But we're a sinking ship. So because we're a sinking ship, we need you to give us subsidies. We need long-term power contracts. We need above market rates. And we need to be classified as clean so we can sell our credits to coal plants so they can run as well, because we're like that with coal plants. Now, it's really important to understand this is happening right now. And of course, this is happening in the next three years, because in three years, this independent system operator, these, the people who control the grid, are going to decide who get the power contracts for the grid. And the struggle in this, of course, is it's not like the pipeline, and I certainly don't support the pipeline, but the pipeline is visceral, right? They're going to go on people's land. They want to dig a pipeline. They want to screw somebody over. And it's real and immediate. And these issues are not like that. They're involved in, with, you know, uh, organizations you can't even spell the name of with things they want to do that you don't know you're screwed till it's over kind of experiences. And yet this is something we have to fight and work on because the danger in this is not just that they'll get subsidies. For God's sake, they've been getting subsidies for 50 years. The danger is what they want to do is stop the revolution in green energy. That's the plan. And they're working with the Koch brothers and others. They don't want net metering. They don't want solar. They don't want wind. They're involved in all the propaganda to tell us how terrible all these things are and how, you know, firemen aren't going to know how to put out a fire if there's a solar panel on a house. <laughs> you know, terrible crime waves of things that can happen. Or, you know, how wind towers are just driving people into mental institutions. There's an endless amount, and that does not mean there aren't problems with all technology. But what we are in is a war, and the war is about whether there really will be a green revolution going forward, or whether it will be stopped. And it will be stopped basically by nukes and coal all over again. So even though I'd like to tell you, hey, just hang that hat up and forget about it. Your job is done. I need to recruit you again. <laughs> and I need to recruit you on a bigger level because these bastards are even harder to deal with than a second-rate corporation from Louisiana like Entergy. These guys play with the big guys. But what they want to stop is sustainable energy revolution, which is happening right now. And they are now working their damnedest with the utilities to stop it. So I want you to join me once again. I know I've taken you down some very strange paths, but we've always <laughs> won. And we will And we have to remember that all of us are more important than a Louisiana corporation yeah. or any other nuclear operator. Because this is our land, and this is where we live, and this is where we make our stand. Thank you. Fantastic, Jeff. I, I just want to say, to add to what Deb said, there's a, the EPA is devising a, a yeah. carbon rule, yeah. and within it, there is tremendous lobbying going on by the Koch brothers, uh, Alec, uh, and uh, the industries, <coughs> nuclear industry, that nukes will be considered clean energy, yeah. and that they will benefit in this trading from that rule. But I also want to say, because uh, I think um, Anna will be coming up next to talk about where we go from here. Uh, I am working with a group of AFSC interns, your UMass students, on a project called Renewables Are Ready. And this project has us looking at 
what's the state of renewables throughout the world, um, not, not exclusively in the United States? We all know that there's enough solar and wind energy in this country, of course, that we could be 100% renewable. But some of the obstacles to it are storage, uh, as one example, scaling up if where it's needed as other examples, but keeping distributed net metering and local uh, uh, solar particularly. Um, and as we do the research, what becomes clear is there are leaders. Germany is one of them, Denmark is another. Uh, but at the same time that the technology that we need for renewables are ready is, is growing, is, is leaping. Uh, and all it needs is the political will. And we know that our country's energy policy is a little bit of everything. 15%, 20% renewables, and then the rest is fossil fuels and nuclear. So this is, as Deb said, is what we're up against. It's not technology, it's political will. So with that, Anna, um, you want to kind of finish by yeah. talking about where do we go, where, where do we go from here? It may seem very uh, presumptuous for, for me, who's been away for so long, to come back with a title like that. But uh, first of all, where do we go from here with the book? Well, we're going to South Hadley um, on November 5th, and to Brattleboro on the 7th, and uh, somewhere else on the 9th, and of course with New Hampshire. Uh, back to the seacoast in December. And I really look forward to that, not just to help present Leonel's amazing work and to reflect on where we were, but also to talk about where we have to go. So I really thank Deb for, and all of her, her colleagues and, and comrades for the decades of work here. Um, where do we go from here? November 4th, we have to vote. There are really great local representatives who need our support, and it's, it's lucky we have them, and in the pipeline fight, that will be really important. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't, the pipeline folks are so busy fighting the pipeline that we, we just got the signs and the literature and stuff, but um, we're all there too. Um, one where do we go from here suggestion that I would like to throw out is to have a Franklin County Energy Forum soon because there's so much going on. And, and I think we really need to look at the big picture. Otherwise, we're just reactive. We're reacting. We don't, oh, new threat. We don't want that. Okay, this. And we're, we're almost competing with each other for the public attention um, when really none of these projects are necessary. What is necessary is the three R's with that. Reduce, recycle, and reuse. reuse. Right. And we have great examples in our area. And speaking now with someone who lives in Wendell, uh, you know, we have a lot of experience in that that we can share with others too. So I, I would really love to, to be part of organizing an energy forum where we could look at all these different, the threats and the political control. Who's making these decisions? And where, where are our pressure points? Because we have a lot of power. And I want to thank uh, John and Claire from the Solar Store for their great work uh, um, in opposing a bill that was really snuck in this summer, uh, which would have, uh, what you said, set solar back 10 years. Uh, well, anyway, it was, it was, anyway, it's a long story. Some of you must have gotten the, the alerts and stuff. But within two weeks, with no money and just email networks, including your network, Save and Green and CAN and all, uh, the legislators were flooded with opposition to this bill and with the request that there be a democratic process of looking at energy for our state. And we won on that yeah. two weeks. So just think what we can do in the next year. And we have to. Thank you very much. Um, oh, ah, come back. Oh, that's me. <laughs> In the rain, Rob Oaken couldn't come tonight. He was on the right, but Pat's here. Uh, so the woman on the horse. Okay. So, so 
Everyone's asking who is this woman on the horse. We do not know. We asked Peter Tushinsky, he's in the picture, <laughs> doesn't know. We asked our friends in Vermont, they don't know. So I think uh, uh, that this is a question that must be answered, and so we have a proposal, and that is a contest. Um, that, that's the picture. That's the picture. So, we have two horses. So, so Lionel is, is ready to, to donate two books. First, to the person who identifies, who finds this woman 40 years later, um, and then to the woman herself, because she's great. And, and the horse. And the horse. Well, we do not have Two books if they identify the horse, too. And, there, <laughs> and there's another message she's giving, besides the no nukes on the horse's rump, and that is that fighting in community is fun, too. And it builds community. And, it, and look at all, all the things that have happened in this community in the 35 years uh, since that nuke was stopped. And uh, agriculture plays a really strong role in it. And every time we buy local and grow our own food and reject industrialized agriculture, we're also contributing to the big change. Um, if you have any money left after buying this book, uh, we recommend, some of us recommend another book, which is Naomi Klein's new book, This Changes Everything, mm -hmm. Capitalism Versus the Climate. And several of us have come to had some new friends and we've come together to examine this book uh, and talk about it. And I'd like to invite one of these new friends, Ben Grosskopf, up. And he will introduce himself and that will be our closing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I want to uh I met Anna when she was at a meeting uh, and said that she was interested in checking out uh, Naomi Klein's new book, uh, This Changes Everything. I actually brought a copy of it, Emily, if you want to pass that around. Uh, this came out just in September, and it really speaks to the ways in which the climate crisis today is opening up new kinds of political possibilities to get at the root of the political and economic system that is currently destroying the planet. And, uh, I think it's, it's uh, an incisive analysis, really, that brings together um, movements from all over the world that are confronting fossil fuel extraction. And um, you know, we, we know that the anti-nuclear struggle and the struggle against the extractive industries are completely interlinked. And um, so, so the, the slide I have is uh, kind of a, a an homage to the book. So I also wanted to just say uh, that I really appreciate uh, the way in which, as you can see this event, you thought of music uh, and the role that music has played in the anti-nuclear movement. Um, I want to mention to you that uh, People's Music Network uh, for Songs of Freedom and Struggle is having our annual winter gathering right here in Greenfield. January 2015, it's January 23rd to 25th, Friday to Sunday. So we're going to have a big concert. Kim and Reggie Harris are our artists in residence this year. Um, and there'll be workshops on, on Saturday and Sunday. We're having organizing meetings here for anyone who wants to get involved. I have flyers on this table uh, uh, and on that table as well. Uh, so I hope that you can get involved. Um, and I don't want to say too much more about PMN without mentioning that one of our members, Karen Brandau, uh, partner of Charlie King, died, uh, as, as you heard, on, on Saturday night. And I just want to uh, dedicate this song to her memory. Karen uh, has been uh, a shining light of wisdom in our community as a musician, as an activist, as a counselor, and as so many other things to so many people here. Uh, we, we've, we've lost a lot with uh, the loss of care. So. Right. This is a, this changes everything. It's got a single on part. I hope you'll join. You've got bottom lines and shareholders to please. This changes everything.
year, me a take more space every single year. Seven billion others live down here. This changes everything. Growth is essential to your paradigm. from